Hello everyone, this is part 5 and last part of chapter 7, Flow Past Immerse Bodies. So, the slides were prepared using your textbook, Fluid Mechanics of Frank White. In the previous lectures, we talked about uh, drag forces, pressure, drag friction, drag, drag coefficient. Uh, the drag coefficient, you know, applied on different geometries, different bodies, different shapes, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. So we provided a complete or, I mean, a, an extensive list of uh, geometries, for instance, from circular cylinders, spheres, uh, square cylinders, different types of uh, bodies when they are exposed to like a cross flow. So you should be able now to uh, look up, you know, whatever you need for most of the geometries if you are asked, for instance, to find the drag forces on a particular uh, body. So here let's continue with the lecture, some additional concluding remarks, and then we will do some examples uh, to conclude this chapter. So here, aerodynamic forces on road vehicles, which is of particular interest. So we do see the evolution of the cars in terms of their external geometry and outfit. So long time ago, they were kind of cubic. And these cubic cars, now you can tell that they do have a large CD. So as you see here, the CD of a car manufactured in like... Uh, 1910 or 1920 the CD was like about 0 0.9 and you could probably tell you should be able to tell that this geometry creates a suppression boundary layer suppression and creates a wake at the back of the car so here circulations and it creates a large pressure drag and then over time based on experience and experiments and uh, improvement in theories the cars have moved toward becoming more streamlined and this curve is actually stops at 2000 but nowadays most cars are like fully streamlined with low uh, CDs drag coefficients you know on the order of 0 0.2 or so and then in part B of this figure of this figure in part B so it shows force data for an idealized smooth automobile shape with upsweep in the rear of the bottom section so this automobile that for instance could represent a race car it does have this kind of section at the back the, the upsweep so because of this geometry the downward force will increase so we see that by simply adding an upsweep angle of 25 degrees so here which is the maximum if this theta is 25 degrees we can quadrupole quadrupole means uh, how many times four times the downward force gaining tire traction at the expense of doubling the drag okay so now let's look at this to see what's happening so the lower k curve shows the drag force of course we do need the lowest drag force because the lower the drag force the lower the required power of the engine so if the drag force increases then it means that you would need a more powerful engine and therefore more uh, fuel consumption so in general an increase in the drag force is not desired right but in so okay so this is for this curve you see that with an increase in the upsweep angle theta the drag force increases so from like 0 0.2 it can increase even to 0 0.4 double and the down, the, then the downward force, the downward force is like this force. So then the downward force 
the coefficient of the downward force also increases as this angle increases up to 25 degrees and then it decreases again. So why would someone want a larger downward force? So here it says that to gain more tire traction. But tire traction is something physical, right? So that's the, the tire traction, the roughness on the tires. So what's the advantage of having good tire traction? The advantage is to be able to provide enough friction so that the car can accelerate quickly. So that can be done physically. And uh, for instance, in the winter, the tires with better traction or uh, larger tractions are used in order to increase the friction and in order to avoid uh, like uh, sliding and you know, slipping on the, on the snow. So this appears to be useful for race for the racing cars where they want to accelerate uh, at a very uh, high rate, large acceleration with, for instance, the same tire. If you use the same tire, but with the aid of this angle, if the downward force is increased, then the friction force will increase. Do you remember friction? Well, it's, it's complicated, but I just write it simply. I don't want to get into details of the, the dynamics and statics because it's a specialized field and I'm not up to speed for that. But you remember that the friction force is equal to a friction coefficient mu multiplied by n and n is the down, downward or normal force. So as you increase the downward force, you simply increase the friction. So when you increase the friction, of course, you increase the drag force. But at the same time, you increase the stability of the car and increase the freak friction so that the car will can the car can take off uh, at a higher acceleration rate. So that's good for racing cars. And uh, in situations that you need a you know a higher tire traction okay so nowadays the computer models actually can model the uh, drag coefficient around any object for instance a streamlined car like this so it used to be experimental in the past but nowadays you can actually develop a geometry run a cfd uh, simulation using the Navier-Stokes equations in a package such as for instance ANSYS Fluent in a package other packages such as uh, COMSOL and then actually as calculate find the velocity field around this car this object find the total uh, friction drag and pressure drag and find CD so there is really no need to perform experiments, the current commercial packages can find CD for you. So this is the, well, so during the evolution, this is like a continuation from the previous slide, how to reduce the drag. So for instance, in this case, it, this is a tractor trailer truck the drag can be reduced by using this kind of uh, deflector added on top of the track. So when deflector is absent, you do have a large, a larger drag coefficient because the flow would separate, for instance, at this point. If there is no deflector, the flow would, prob would separate you know, at this point. But be, if you do use a deflector, then the flow would become more streamlined and remain here and then separate, you know, further down. So the presence of this deflector, as you could tell intuitively, reduces the drag force. And these curves, these curves here, one shows the air resistance with the vehicle speed. 
and the corresponding horsepower so the horsepower is equal to the drag force multiply by the speed of the vehicle so the air resistance which is the drag force I believe it's the total drag force friction and pressure force increases with an increase in the vehicle speed therefore it's also important to know that you know the faster you drive for instance above the nominal point of the uh, engine design operation then you would burn more fuel the fuel consumption rate de in decreases the fuel com consumption increases at high velocities or high speed so this is like 112 this is like probably 70 miles per hour but however the engines have been designed to perform optimally at for instance like 80 90 kilometers per hour so if you drive too slow then your engine will not operate at the optimum point so it may not be economical if you drive too fast the end the, the drag force will increase uh, kind of uh, uh, with velocity squared so you will burn more fuel so the optimal operation of the engine with optimal fuel economy would be pro perhaps somewhere like here so driving too slow the engine doesn't work at its optimal uh, design uh, rate and if you drive too fast again you go above the optimal limit and also you burn too much fuel so well this chapter is quite broad it, it has a lot of theory and a lot of useful things so I didn't go over everything in this chapter but I covered most important part of the chapter so a combination of uh, theories and equations and also applied things for instance the uh, drag coefficients and so on here I just would like to briefly mention about forces on lifting bodies without going to the details so this is the a schematic of a, a wing cross section or an airfoil so this is the airfoil with several uh, terminologies the cord of the airfoil the thickness span therefore the platform area is B times C and we do have an angle of attack so if usually you have seen that the wings have an angle of attack on the ground and even you know at steady conditions at cruise conditions there is still an angle of attack and during takeoff the angle of attack further increases to increase the lift force so the angle of attack is the angle between the direction of the air stream and the direction the court the, the axis of the court of the airfoil so and there and then we do have the drag force and lift force so the drag force is the force which is exerted by the air on the airfoil it is an S streamlined body so it's expected that friction drag is dominant the lift force sorry the drag force has to be counterbalanced by the thrust of the aircraft engine during cruise flight and the lift which is generated on the airfoil and upward force is actually used to counterbalance the weight of the aircraft so when lift is equal to the weight of the aircraft then the altitude will remain fixed during the takeoff lift is larger than the weight so the aircraft can actually uh, ascend or rise and during landing the lift is reduced 
and then the weight will become larger than the lift and the aircraft starts to descend. So here we define lift coefficient and drag coefficient. So the drag coefficient is the same as before. The drag force divided, divided by the velocity head and divided by AP. AP is the planform area. So if the wing is like rectangular, we, then planform area would be simply chord multiplied by span. But this really is not the case in reality because the the wing does not have a uniform cross section. So it is like uh, wider at the when it attached when it's attached to the aircraft and then it becomes narrower as we go far away from the wing. So therefore the area would be anyway, the area of the wing would be the total planform area. The lift coefficient would be the lift force L divided by the same terms as the terms used in the, in the drag coefficient. So in the case of CD, you remember we said that the drag coefficient is a function of Reynolds number and roughness, so roughness is another term, but if we assume that roughness is the same, then that's a constant. So CD, the drag coefficient would change with the Reynolds number and also with alpha, the angle of attack. Similarly, the lift coefficient would change with Reynolds number and angle of attack for a given roughness. So therefore, as the roughness of, uh, as the angle of attack changes, this, the lift and drag coefficients will change. And the Reynolds number are commonly in the turbulent range. And in this case, we have a couple of uh, dimensions in the problem. Reynolds number, for instance, can be obtained in terms of the chord length, C. And we are usually in the turbulent region, uh, region because the speed of the aircraft is large, dimensions are large, so. And since the uh, Reynolds number is pretty large, so these coefficients become kind of insensitive or not much sensitive to the Reynolds number. If you remember from the drag uh, curves in the previous chapters, for large Reynolds numbers, the drag coefficient, for instance, for a flat plate, for large Reynolds numbers, the drag coefficients become independent of the Reynolds number. So I don't want to go into the details, but I just want to tell you briefly how lift is generated, if you are wondering. So how lift is generated? That's you know out of curiosity, of course. So if you look at case D, when the flow field has well developed, around an airfoil. So this would be like the angle of attack. So this would be alpha. So you could actually turn it, make it horizontal, so that you can better feel the angle of attack. So this is, for instance, like the direction of the air stream. So this would be let's say V or U, and then this is the, the airfoil. So when the flow has been developed, uh, you know, in a steady way, then you see that it comes here, it comes to a stagnation point. So the stagnation point would be somewhere like here. That's where the velocity becomes zero. And then the air streams would be split into two branches. So one branch, the upper branch goes above the airfoil than the lower branch. And then they would reach or meet or merge one another at the back of the airfoil. And far from the airfoil, you, you, they would nicely merge and create uh, 
vortex far from the the leading edge uh, far from the trailing edge so let's see what happens during this process just this is a, a very simple conceptual uh, analysis or conceptual uh, description of the problem we want to see how a drag how a lift force is generated during this process so you see that here the air is traveling this distance from the stagnation point to the trailing edge at the bottom and the air you know on the top of the airfoil would travel a larger distance so it would travel a larger distance to reach the la the same last final point so because the air at the bottom and uh, on the top must reach the same point at the same time so it means that the velocity of the air on the upper part of it must be higher because it's going to travel a larger distance so lower velocity uh, sorry higher velocity on the top means that the pro the pressure on the top must be smaller than the pressure at the bottom so the pressure on the top should be less than the pressure at the bottom so if we call that p1 p2 so p2 down here below the airfoil is larger than p1 so the difference would be like a pressure force so this pressure force when multiplied by the cross one by this platform area creates the lift force okay so i hope that you got the point this is a very rough description of the process but it answers why a lift force is created so the reason is that again uh well you can actually i already explained that so better not to repeat it that's sometimes well not sometimes a stall happens so this is a condition that has to be prevented a stall so you see an airfoil here exposed to a uniform flow and this is the angle of attack so the angle of attack if the angle of attack becomes too large in this case what you see in the picture the angle of attack has become too large then the flow may separate right at the nose of the airfoil so if this happens if this happens then this is not good because the favorable condition that we talked about in the previous slide can go away and this can result in destruction of the lift and can affect the performance of the aircraft and even can have, can result in loss of the lift force so this is called a stall at high angle of attack there you see a smoke flow visualization shows the stalled flow on the upper surface of a lifting vane so this has to be uh, prevented or controlled that's why the for instance the, the commercial airliners they do have like a maximum angle of attack they cannot like uh, climb you know with a very sharp angle of attack if that happens if the nose goes up too much up or down then that's going to cause a problem that's going to cause you know problems such as separation of boundary layer stall and so on so however the the uh, the fighter jets they are supersonic they do have a different design so they can actually tolerate the stall condition and they can even you know uh, fly with a very sharp angle of attack so it, it all depends on the design but this is a condition which may happen a stall in the compress even in the compressors and turbines because compressors and turbines use uh, similar kind of uh, air foils and blades
All right, so let's do a couple of more problems from the end of this chapter. So we can actually do many problems. So we do have many different geometries. Each geometry has its own uh, drag coefficient, uh, like different conditions, turbulent, laminar, flat plate, change the direction, orientation, one side, double side, uh, circular cylinder or sphere, rectangular. So there are many combinations or many ways of, you know, coming up with problems. So we just do a couple of them so that you get a sense of how to approach these problems. So a ship tows a submerged cylinder okay 1.5 meter in diameter and 22 meter long so this is like a slender uh, so cylinder it's very long so oops so at u equal to 5 meter per second in fresh water at 20 degrees c we can go ahead and find density and viscosity under this condition, estimate the towing power in kilowatts if the cylinder is. So it depends whether we want to tow this cylinder like this in this direction or we want to tow it, let's say, in this direction. If we want to tow it in this direction, like uh, this so this is two different problems right so a parallel this is like a parallel and b normal to the toe direction so i believe this is a and this condition is b so this is our cylinder we can either tow it in parallel direction a or in using you know multiple uh, strings or ropes or cables and we can it in the other direction so probably intuitively you could tell that if you use condition a you would need a lower smaller drag force so the drag force in case b would appears to be larger just intuitively based on this large aspect ratio so now we will go ahead and calculate it so for this condition of water, the density and viscosity are found from the tables. They are either given in the exam to you or you just uh, use the tables to find them. Then for the parallel case, you need to find, for each of these two cases, you need to find CD. So of course, these CDs will not be given to you. You need to go ahead and use tables and figures of the book and find the best estimate for this drag coefficients. It's, well, it is easy and it is not easy. It is easy because it's just you need to go to the right table and figure and use the CD. If it's not easy, if, if you don't know what is where, if you don't know, if you have no idea, if you are not practiced, then you will get lost in what table or what figure to use. So, okay, so in the tables, we need to look for cylinders like this with an aspect ratio. So if you go and see table 7.3, I have cut and pasted a part of that table here for you. So this is the parallel, this shows the parallel case, flat faced cylinder and CD, this is CD. CD has been given for multiple cases, the drag coefficient, for various L over D aspect ratios. So from one, two, four to eight. So what is the aspect ratio in our problem? Length over diameter is 15. And uh, well, 15 is not in this table, it's up to eight. So from, you know, after eight, you are kind of, you can go ahead and extrapolate. So it may not be accurate, 
but you can go ahead and extrapolate if you want to do linear extrapolation you can use 0.4 and 8 so let's say this is cd at 0.4 and then little bit increases and this is cd at 8 l over d equal to 8 so then for 15 then if you linearly extrapolate it becomes a point some somewhere here so if you double l over d 8 becomes 16 and this becomes almost equal to 2 so linear extrapolate this is based on linear extrapolation but this may not be realistic because if you look at data point two and four at two cd is 85 percent at four is 87 percent so it didn't double so linear interpolation is not a good idea it seems that uh, it seems that cd is increasing probably something like this based on this fashion something like that so it's not linear but anyway so the best way is to uh pass a curve from all of these one two three four points and then do an do a curve fitting and extrapolation considering all of these four points in excel in excel if you plot cd as a function of l over d then you can have then you can pass a curve a polynomial of order three or four and then you can extrapolate for the next L over D. But in the exam, you don't have this kind of time, unlimited time to do this. So in the exam, I suggest that you just say that at eight, uh, C is equal to one. So since the changes are slowing down from four to eight, so at 15, you can use again this same number, 99, or you say that at uh, L over D equal to 15. CD is, for instance, equal to 1 or 1.1. So this 1.1 is based on a complete uh, care fitting, considering all points. So in the exam, or if you want to do a quick estimate, and a quick engineering estimate, you just say that, okay, you see that from the figure, CD is equal, about it's equal to 1. So that would suffice. All right, so there is one more condition that has to be satisfied when you use table 7.3. It is not shown here, but that condition is that Reynolds number must be larger than, I believe, 10 to the 4. So you can go ahead and calculate Reynolds number based on L. So here, characteristic length is either D and L, but since it's, we do have a parallel flow, it's more realistic to calculate the Reynolds number based on the length of the cylinder. So the length of the cylinder is 22 meters. If you calculate Reynolds number, it becomes much larger than 10 to the 4. If you calculate it based on D, the Reynolds is still larger than 10 to the 4. Okay, so once CD is known, the force is equal to CD times one half times density times velocity square times the cross sectional area. So you need to look at the table again and see what cross sectional area has to be used. So in this case, it's kind of obvious that the cross sectional area to be used is the frontal area, the, the area of the circle. So pi d squared over 4, 24,000. Then if you multiply the power, the force by the speed, you get the power in watts, 120,000 watts or 120 kilowatts. So that's for the parallel case. For the normal case, it's when you pull it from the side. Okay, so then you need to go ahead and find the right table. So I there are actually two options for this. One is 
again table uh, I believe 73 I have cut and pasted a part of that table so a part of that table shows flow over a cylinder a circular cylinder with a cross with an aspect ratio of one to one so aspect ratio of one to one means it's spherical for laminar flow it's 1.2 for turbulent flow 0 0.3 given for all Reynolds numbers provided that the Reynolds is like larger than 10 to the 4 something like that it's mentioned in the table so that's way that's one way of using uh, finding CD so in order to see what is the whether you are in the laminar or turbulent you calculate Reynolds number in terms of the diameter here and uh, you see that it is 7.5 10 to the 6 it is definitely in the turbulent region because it's larger than 5 times uh, 10 to the 5 so it's turbulent so CD is about 0 0.3 that's one way of doing it another way of doing it is to use uh, the one of the figures the figure that gives you CD as a function of Reynolds number we talked about it in the previous lectures and one case was a cylinder a smooth circular cylinder this one so you see that it CD is given in terms of the Reynolds number so your Reynolds number is 7 times 10 to the 6 so this is 10 to the 6 and then 7 times 10 to the 6 should be somewhere like here so note that note that this is a log log curve so it is not very easy to use it and the details of this scaling this the grades are not given but they are not equally like uh, separated or placed so need to be careful about that so that's why even though the solution says that you use figure 716a if you use that for this Reynolds number you just move up until it intersects the curve and then you see what CD this is associated with so you can you can basically see what CD is associated with it's, you see that it's less than one it's between 0 0.1 and less than one now it is a debate that uh, how i mean how do you know because this is not graded properly so you could say that this is okay 0 0.4 5 7 so it is a little bit hard but from the table you see that it should be around 0 0.3 and anyway so if you choose 0 0.3 it is fine the the book so the, the solution says that 0 0.4 if you choose 0 0.3 from the table it would be fine and the the curve the figure also validates that it's like 0 0.3 0 0.4 so now you go ahead and find the force cd times density one half times velocity squared times the area so what area should you use in this case so in this case you should use the frontal area right so the frontal area would be the diameter multiplied by the length so that would be like the area which is normal to the speed so that's given also in the table the table tells you what area you should use when you look at the table okay so <clears throat> that was a very straightforward but good question for instance another problem here 756 a delivery a delivery vehicle carries a long sign on top 
as in the figure if the sign is very thin so this is the, the sign it's vertical it's like a vertical plate so the thickness is very small and the vehicle moves at 105 kilometer per hour estimate the forces on the sign with no cross winds so if it is moves straight forward and uh, if there is no cross wind cross wind means you know if there is a wind in any direction other than parallel to the plate so in case a assume that there is no cross wind okay so now it looks like that we have a flat plate and we have air approaching this flat plate from both sides so but this flat plate is actually vertical usually our flat plates that we were considering before they were like horizontal thin horizontal and we were saying that okay a boundary layer forms like this on both sides of it so this was like we were looking at this plate in a horizontally but now it's vertically it's the same so we can go ahead and use the flat plate equations in order to find the drag force acting on both sides the properties are found from the tables convert the velocity to meter per second <clears throat> because the unit for si unit for velocity is meter per second if you calculate Reynolds number based on the length of this plate which is eight meters then it becomes 1.56 10 to the 7th turbulent so you go ahead and use the correlation for turbulent flow by the way is it what's the roughness so uh, the roughness is not given so we assume that it's smooth so we use the correlation for a smooth turbulent flow and therefore we find CD then the drag force will be equal to CD times one half of density velocity squared times the area of the plate multiplied by two because the drag force is acting on both sides so multiply by two for both sides it becomes 14.3 newton so part this is part A, the drag force, which does not seem to be too large if there is no cross winds. So now the problem with the cross wind is that if there is a cross wind, so if for instance there is an airflow, let's say in this direction, normal or with an angle, then that can cause probably some problems for instance it can try to for instance uh, destabilize the motion of the car it can even cause a lift because this may look like an airfoil in a stream of air with an angle of attack so even if a lift force can be generated trying to push the car sideways so that can cause a problem so we didn't go go over the correlations for the lift force so this part b is actually not a part of what we have covered but it's important to understand it that even though in parallel with the direction of the air it's fine but if this plate is too long and if there is some cross winds those cross winds can actually uh, destabilize the, the the car even you know uh, let it you know tip over from the side okay all right and last problem that we want to talk about in this chapter 790 in the great hurricane of 1938 winds of 38 meter per second blew over a boxcar in Providence, Rhode Island. So this is the uh, the boxcar. 
The box car was three meter high. The height three meters. Well, here it says three o five. <clears throat> three o five, but the problem says three meters. So let's stick with the, what the problem says. Three meter high. Twelve meter long. So the length is twelve. Here again, the number is a little bit different. I don't know why. And it's 1.8 meter wide. So here it says 150 here. <clears throat> okay, so this is the width is 1.5 and the track, the tracks are separated at 1.5 meter. So what wind speed would topple a boxcar weighing 180 kilonewton? So, okay. So wind is blown, is blowing in this direction. And there is a distance clearance between the track and this box. So air can go through as well. So this looks like you do have a uh, this box standing in you know in the air stream without interruption made by the ground <laughs> so we find the density and viscosity that's not a problem so the the, la the next part is to find the drag coefficient for this kind of object so if you look at your tables and graphs and curves see what you have there so I checked all of the tables and graphs. It seems that we do not have a curve for a three-dimensional object, a three-dimensional prism like this, rectangular. Instead, we do have uh, a table for this case. We do have a table for rectangular plate with variable aspect ratio. So this means that in, this means that if we can, if we neglect the width of this box, then we can replace it by actually just one plate, rectangular plate. So in, it means that replace that box with this box, which is like thinner. But everything else would remain the same. Okay, so based on this, if we go ahead and calculate the aspect ratio, the aspect ratio B over H, B over H is like uh, uh, 12 meters over uh, 3 meters, B over H is equal to 4. And from this table, you see that it's given for 1, 5, so for 5, it's 1.2. And for 1, it's 1.18. So you can go ahead with 1.2. So therefore, CD is equal to 1.2 from this table. This is the best, this table, this part of this table, this, is the, this gives the best estimate for CD. Because there is no other option. Well, of course, there is, you know, options in other books and in the literature and in engineering design books for this kind of condition. But based on the textbook, you should choose and uh, select the best option, the best available option to do the problem. So for this, for non-zero thickness, this CD may slightly change, but still what we have chosen, a plate, still it resembles the reality because on this box, you would expect flow separation on these edges from the top and from the bottom. So when you use a table, still you would have the same thing, flow separation here and here. So therefore this CD from this table is, this reflects the reality. So force is equal to CD diameter uh, over two Velocity squared B times H, the frontal area. So it becomes 
but we don't have the velocity. We want to find the velocity which is responsible for toppling this uh, boxcar. So we write it in terms of the velocity and the force becomes this times velocity square. Then we need to use our statics knowledge. So this force acts in the middle of this plate because the velo air velocity is uniform. So this force acts in the middle of this plate. So that would be like that this would be the force acting here, which is also shown here. So it creates a moment. So if it, if it wants to be toppled, it would be toppled about what point? This point of the track, right? So it's sitting on the track. So it would topple about this point. So if we write the moment equation about this point, so the force multiplied by the distance, the arm of the, this moment, so the distance would be uh, 90 centimeters plus 150 uh, centimeter, which would be 2.4 centimeters. And this has to be balanced by the weight, the weight of the box. So assuming that the, the center of gravity of this box is right at the center, if, for instance, in the box, the, the items are not distributed evenly, then the center of mass may be, you know, shifted to the left, to the right, but let's assume that it's right in the middle. So therefore, the weight W of the car, which is given 180 kilotons, so need to be careful about the units, need to multiply it by 1,000. Multiply by the arm of this moment, which would be half of the track uh, uh, spacing. The track spacing here, it says that 151.5 meters, so half of it would be 0 0.75. Therefore, we can find V square, 46 meters per second. So that would be like the, the air velocity needed to topple this car. If we go back to the problem, it says that the wind's velocity or speed were 38 meters per second. So this 46 is a little bit larger than this 38. So it's possible that this estimate is not accurate. So the wind velocities at some points have accelerated to like this higher velocity required for overturning the box. Or it's possible that, for instance, if the center of mass had been shifted a little bit to the close to this point to the right then a, then a wind with a lower speed lower than 46 would also be able to topple the car all right so this brings us to the end of this chapter here we neglected the effect of the third dimension based on what we had available in the tables <laughs> So, as you see, you know, a many different kind of problems can be given from this chapter based on uh, CD coefficients of uh, different types of geometries, different bodies, three-dimensional, two-dimensional. We had the flow or a flat plate. Uh, we have equation to calculate the uh, boundary layer thickness the friction, skin friction coefficient CF, and also the drag coefficient CD. So uh, this chapter, as I said, is like a very broad and theoretical chapter combined with some very applied and experimental uh, and engineering design lessons. So I try to summarize it in a way that we provide you know the fundamentals and theory you know as much as needed and also go ahead to the uh, practical parts and do some uh, you know practical engineering examples 
So I believe that it's been covered now in a good way. So that brings us to the end of this coronavirus uh, semester. I hope that you have enjoyed the course and this chapter. And uh, thank you for your attention.